Christmas church family. Come on, let's give Jesus praise in the house. Oh, come on, you could do better than that. Let's give him a praise only. This is King Jesus. King Jesus, people. Amen. Hey, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Pastor John. I'm one of the staff members here at New Anthem Church, and I'm so blessed to be bringing you the word, and so glad that you're in the house. I know we have so many special guests, family members, uh, people from out of town, people that were drug here, manipulated to come here, promise you'd get extra presents if you came here, uh, but shocker, spoiler alert, you are not here because someone drug you here. You're here by divine appointment. You heard me correctly. God wanted you here to hear a specific word that's going to allow you to leave this place different than the way that you walked in. Do we believe that, church? Amen. And so we're going to lean into that word today, and uh, we want to say welcome to our church family. Uh, I want to welcome, as always, those that are tuned in, watching by way of Facebook and YouTube and our app. Let's welcome our online audience this morning as well. And we are glad that you're tuned in as well. Man, this is our fifth Christmas as a church. 9 a.m. was a little bit more excited. Y'all had your coffee. I expected more, but that's okay. Um, and so we're excited for what God is doing in the life of our church. And I'm really excited to bring you the word. As, as I began to kind of ponder on uh, the message for this week, um, you always want like a you always want like a banger, just something like just you know awesome. Like it's just like it's the it's the Super Bowl for church. You know you're nodding. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just like <laughs> let's like. You know, I want to leave here encouraged, and and uh, and today is going to be a little bit of a different message, um, because we're just going to go like simple gospel. And the reason we're going simple gospel is because the Christmas story is a simple gospel message, and that that bumper video we just watched literally rings true for every single one of us as followers of Jesus. That what we celebrate every single year is good news, that good news has come. Be encouraged today, regardless of the weight that you maybe walked in here with, that what we celebrate every single year is that the good news, that hope, as we said last week, isn't something that's on its way, it's something that's here, and it's Man. here in the person of Jesus. Hope isn't a thing or an idea or emotion, something you can tap into like a good vibe. Hope is a person, and it's Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, yeah. sent on the greatest rescue mission of all time. Amen? <laughs> Over the last couple of years, um, I... Uh, <laughs> I have this reoccurring memory, this memory I always go back to. I, I consider myself, I considered myself growing up a pretty good kid. Um, I had a couple rough years. Uh, I had some years that I would end up on Santa's naughty list. And I was thinking on a memory of uh, a year that I was, it wasn't great for me. Now at the time, my parents did the whole Santa thing and, and I full on like, I was like, uh, you know, I want presents, I want presents from Santa, naughty list, nice list, I get the rules. And leading up to the specific Christmas, I think I was maybe like seven, eight years old, I don't really know. Um, I knew I was on the naughty list and I knew like I had to turn some things around or uh, I was just gonna be getting cold or maybe nothing, I don't really know. Um, and so, um, and, and, and here was my turning point. My turning point was, I can't remember exactly what I did, but it warranted uh, this response from my dad. My dad said, if you don't straighten up, by the way, what does that mean? I have no clue. Does anyone know what that, I still to this day don't know what that means, but like it'd be the phrase, I don't know where it came from, I don't know the origin of that phrase, but it's, if you don't straighten up, there will be no Christmas for you. And that's all I needed to hear. Like God spoke to me in that moment, you know, like you should probably straighten up. <laughs> Otherwise I'm not gonna get any, any presents. And I, I think about that memory often and I, I was thinking about it this year and, and really I kinda, kinda blew up that idea uh, to kind of like a larger, a larger narrative. Like what would this season, what would like the month of December be like, feel like, without Christmas? Like, what would, what would this part of our year look like? When we get to December, the seasons change, we're starting to see snow, not very consistently, not very much of it, uh, I, I grant you that, but, but, like, it, but without Christmas, without the tree, without our, our favorite red and green colors, without 
all of these different symbols, without the tinsel, without the, the bulbs, without all of these different decorations, right? Without all of the nativity scenes that, that every single one of us love. You know, know what I'm, ones I'm talking about, right? With the little, the little shepherds and, and they're just like standing nice and tall and, and uh, weirdly they look like models, you know, and their beards are perfectly shaven. I'm like, I don't know if they look like that. All the shepherds and all their little nativity sets, they all look curiously white for Jewish people, right? And, um, and then they have the rest of the nativity and you have the, the little wise men and the little Mary and Joseph, which look like supermodels. And then you have baby Jesus who isn't crying, who isn't upset about anything, even though apparently he was just born, just sitting there in his manger, six pack abs, you know, <laughs> just the perfect nativity scene. Um, and, and, and yet beyond all of this, like we, without Christmas, we don't have any of this. We don't have the angels. We don't have the wise men. We don't have any of it. And I would contend that any moment in history without Christmas would ultimately be a Christless reality. A season without Christmas would be a Christless reality. And now why do I share and start with any of that? Because the text that we're going to be reading today, which is like the most Christmassy passage of all the Bible that, that most churches, we, we like to look at pretty much every single year, this was actually the environment of what was going on here on earth that Jesus was actually born into. Like, we, we love reading the Word of God, and we love reading the Christmas story, and, and how the, the, the very first Christmas, Jesus born, the perfect, quiet, silent night with the star in the sky. We love thinking about this and pondering on uh, about thoughts about this, and yet, many of us, we don't think back to what was the world and what was all of humanity like without Christ, without Christmas, wow. without the hope for all mankind, without the hope of humanity. And so, so as we dive into our text, I want us to kind of keep this at the forefront of our minds. As we dive into the story of Jesus, we're going to look at Mary and Joseph, Jesus to be born, and then we're going to be looking at mostly the shepherds, some smelly shepherds out in the field who are ready to receive this birth announcement. And I'm just going to give you the end of my message. I love breaking rules that pastors aren't supposed to do. Here, here, here's really where we're going. There is an end game for this good news of the gospel that Jesus came to announce to all of humanity. And here is the end game. Here's, I, here's what I believe God wants you to leave here with, with a story to tell and a song in your heart. With the story to tell and a song in your heart. What does that mean? Well, I, I believe the answer this morning might surprise you. We're going to dive into our text, Luke chapter 2, verse 2. The words will be uh, on the screen as well for us to read along. It says this. In those days, Caesar, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their, uh, uh, on their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them do not be afraid I bring good news that will cause great joy for all people today in the town of David a savior has been born to you he's the Messiah the Lord and this will be a sign to you you will find the baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. 
And on the eighth day, when it came time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. May God bless the reading of his word today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, church family? Father, we just come before you and uh, we, we make a conscious effort and choice to do two things. To one, to, to cast out all distractions because this season is not without real just distractions and dynamics of our lives outside of this building. But God, we also ask that you would place in our hearts the reason of why we're here, the reason for this season that you would illuminate our hearts and awaken us to a brand new reality about who you are, about what this season is truly about. And so God, we're reading a familiar story, one that we either read or watch or listen to pretty much every year. And what we're believing by the power of your Holy Spirit is that you're going to speak a fresh word and a fresh revelation according to your will. So God, I pray I would decrease, that you would increase, and that your word would go forth in power. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Um, this is one of my favorite accounts from Brother Luke. Um, inside the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see four different vantage points, all telling the same story of Jesus' earthly ministry. And Luke's one of my favorites. Uh, the vantage point of Luke is very unique because uh, more than any other person in the Bible, any other author in the Bible, Luke was the one author that didn't have a Jewish uh, origin. Luke was actually Greek, and he was a doctor, and he was a nerdy doctor. Man, people in 9 a.m. got a little bit offended by that, too. It's okay. I married a nerd. It's all good. Like, it's fine. But he was a nerdy doctor. And we see this in his writings. He shares way too much information. In fact, there are more words per topic in his writings in both Luke and Acts. Because what Luke did after, 30 years after, following this passage that we just read, is go around town to town getting eyewitness accounts from people that had interactions with Jesus or had seen the things that he had seen and, and ultimately getting record of all of these different stories from Jesus. And here's what's fascinating is that in chapters one and two, there is theological uh, agreement that it was most likely Mary, mother of Jesus, that Luke was interviewing to bring us the passage that we just read. So this is very significant. It's most likely Mary, mother of Jesus, that he was interviewing to get this information to our text that we just read. And so what I wanna do for the rest of our time today is, is, is take this account take this story, and I want to kind of zoom in on the shepherds in this story. And as we zoom in on the shepherds, we're going to discover, I believe, the full realization of the gospel and the good news made alive in our life. Does that sound good, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Number one, if you have your notes, you can write this down. Number one, write this word down, announcement, announcement. If you didn't know, any amount of faith in Jesus that we have begins with an announcement. And I want to show you this contextually in verse 9. It says this, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Verse 10, watch this, this is huge. But the angels said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. And in this sentence that this angel shares is the full realization of the gospel of Jesus Christ wrapped up into one sentence. So, so let, let, a couple of you guys are like, I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing it, Pastor John. Let me, just, let me just break it down a little bit. Okay, let's go to the first phrase that he says. Verse 10, do not be afraid. Now, this was said for two reasons, because oftentimes when an angel would just kind of show up or materialize, it would freak people out, which makes sense, right? That's how, how we know the story probably has some truth to it, right? Because I would definitely freak out if that happened. But he also said, do not be afraid for another reason. I believe this angel is speaking to a lost, hurting, scared world that needs a savior. So you, you heard me right. The world 
isn't just lost, hurting, scared, and broken in 2023, but 2,000 years ago, they were dealing with the same issue. So this angel's speaking, he's saying, hey, don't freak out. Don't be afraid. And he's saying this for a specific reason. He says, I have some good news. This is the first thing that he says. This is the, the second piece of the gospel. He says, don't be afraid. There's a scared, hurting, and broken world. Don't be afraid. Why? Because there's some good news. And can I tell you, we need more good news in our life as believers. We need more good news in our life. Why? Because our world is fueled on bad news and outrage. Right? Like it's nothing but bad news. The funny thing is, you can't even turn on the actual news without hearing bad news. In fact, if I want to hear good news, the only thing that, here's what I have to do. I have to watch the news where I used to live in northern Michigan because almost nothing ever happens there. And so you watch the news, it's like, this gerbil was rescued today. And you're like, what? What are we talking about here? And then like, you turn on the news here and there's like a shooting like down the road from my house. One time we turned on the news, it was like in our apartment complex. We're like, this is, I'm going to keep watching the northern Michigan news, right? Like, get, bring, bring on the gerbils, you know? And so... So there is good news that we need in our life, but this angel gets specific because good and news and good news can mean whatever we want it to mean. For you, good news might be finding you won a Lamborghini or a Maserati or just like whatever dream car like you have. That might be good news for you, but this angel gets specific. It's not good news fill in the blank with whatever good news you feel like is to you. There's a specific type of good news that has a very specific outcome. And here's the specific outcome. This good news is going to cause great joy. Great joy, which is the greatest news in the universe. Notice, the angel, he didn't say happiness, did he? He didn't say happiness. You wanna know why? I believe because happiness is cheap. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is empty and hollow. Because happiness can be taken from you in a moment. Because happiness is directly connected to happenings. Like, your happiness is contingent on the things that are happening to you. Every single one of us have had that day where it's just like everything's working out. Everything's like the sun's shining, even our dog's behaving himself, right? And it just takes one person in traffic, one smart alecky comment, and your day is ruined. But see, joy is everlasting because joy comes from the Lord. And it doesn't matter. Jo joy happens and grows and fosters and bubbles up regardless of circumstance, regardless of happenings. And so this needs to be our pursuit. And this is ultimately, the, so now we're starting to see the gospel, right? Like scared, hurting, don't be afraid. Here's why. Got good news. This good news is going to cause great everlasting joy. Now, angel, who is this good news for? All the people. I did some work because I knew you guys would be asking, so I, so I did some work. I went back to the original language and I looked up the word all. You want to know what it means? All. <laughs> Everybody. Every, the, all the people. This is the good news of the gospel, and it's for everyone, everywhere. And so here's what this angel's doing. He's, he's saying the greatest news ever, and then he's wrapping all of humanity, past, present, and future, into this good news. He says everyone has, an, uh, has access to it. But Pastor John, I, I thought people, like, I thought God elects people. Like, I, I thought God chose certain people. We can have that theological debate some other day, but this word says it's for everybody. It's for all the people. So if your world today is full of division, full of disunity, maybe like me, you've been turned off to the worst kind of Christians in the world that think Christianity is about exclusivity and how many people we can push out and cut out from the family of God. That is not the good news. That's the worst news ever. The good news of the gospel bids us to come home. Why? Because on the other side of us turning and coming into the family of God is the richest and most abundant life possible. Are you with me this morning, church? Amen. So we have this announcement. And, <laughs> and God gives this announcement 
to some smelly shepherds. Like, guys, we've romanticized shepherds today with the, as aforementioned, uh, nativity scenes like we've we've romanticized like that's our favorite part right because they have the little sheep and they have the little shepherd and they have the little crook and they have the little and it's so cute and they go right next to Mary and Joseph and the, like we have romanticized shepherds today but in this specific culture that we were just reading about shepherds weren't romanticized conversely they were ostracized they were pushed to the outskirts not just of the metropolitan communities and areas but to the edges of society. They were looked down upon. They were looked at as animals because they cared for animals, as unclean because they worked with and cared for unclean animals. Some weren't even allowed into places of worship. And wouldn't it be just like Jesus to save this first birth announcement for some smelly shepherds pushed to the outskirts of society? And this is exactly what he does. That's right. Jesus, with this message, he didn't go to the burbs first. He went to the ghetto with this message of hope. And there was a specific response from these shepherds after this miracle of this angelic visitation and and, and message of of deliverance of, of, hey, there's a savior that's been born. This will be the sign. There was a specific response that it warranted. And so this is number two, and I want you to write this down. And that is the word search. That is the word search. Let's reread verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. I would contend that there was more at play than just an announcement, but that one of the purposes of this announcement was to elicit action within these shepherds. So they didn't just sit there and say, well, that was weird. That is not something you see every day. No, they were like, we got to go see this for ourselves. Like, we got to go see this for ourselves. Isn't it interesting? Their response from this miraculous thing happening wasn't them falling on their faces and worshiping. Wasn't them celebrating. No, that actually came later. They needed to see if all of this was actually true first. They went on a search to find Jesus. And I just want to lean in a bit here because maybe this morning, maybe you came in, you've already made your mind up about Jesus. Maybe you think that's why you're not here. Can I just encourage you today that Jesus welcomes skeptics? It's not popular to preach in church, but it is the truth. Jesus, in his kingdom, in his economy, Jesus welcomes skeptics. Jesus says, bring your questions. Bring the things that you don't understand. You want to know what you can even bring to the table? Science. You want to know how I know? Because God invented it. We can bring all of it, all of our wonderings, all of the things we're not sure about, all the things that we're like, I wouldn't do it that way if I was God. We can bring all of that to the table, and we start a search. And for many of us, that's actually how we found Jesus, is we heard the information, announcement, But then, number two, we went on a search. This is what the shepherds did. They didn't just take this miraculous sign and move on. It started creating them, creating within them the desire to go on a search. And imagine their surprise when they went on a journey to find Jesus, finally found him, only to discover that it was actually God who had been searching for them the whole time. I don't know if that like blows your mind like it blows my mind, but I, I just want to encourage you that before you've made a decision to search after Jesus, for some of you, maybe you haven't actually made that decision. For some of you, maybe you're on that search long before you ever made that decision. Jesus was searching for you. Jesus isn't hiding. It's not hide and go seek. It's not Marco Polo, try to find Jesus. No, he is on an active search for you. And here's what's so amazing about our Savior Jesus is he doesn't stop searching once he finds you. He keeps searching. He keeps trying to woo you, lean you in, and, and trying to bring you into the fold and shape you and make you and mold you into the person 
that he created you to be. This is who Jesus, this is what Jesus does. This is who he is. So there is an announcement. There is a search. And thirdly, we can write this word down. There's actually a second announcement, which I'm calling a proclamation. There's a proclamation. Verse 17 says this. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about them, about this child, or to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is crazy. So, so what we just read is that ordinary men and women responded to the gospel in this way. And they started telling everyone everywhere, started sharing the story, started singing and praising and worshiping, not out of any kind of righteous judgment or shame, but out of no other response than that truth and that good news welling up within them a passion that they simply could not keep to themselves. Because how many know true love can't help itself but to be announced, to go to those who need it most. This is true not just with our relationship with the God of heaven. This is true with our earthly relationships as well. This is why I annoyed so many people on social media the first year I was dating my wife, Cece. Come on. Right? Because every, even like the really lame dates we'd go on, I'd be like, best date ever, best girl ever, girl of my dreams, night of my dreams, like every single time. The funny thing is... Homegirl didn't post anything. Like, she was just like, she wouldn't even like it when I would post it. She was just like, eh, like whatever. But I just like, I, yeah, I, anyways, yeah, I, I'm that role in our relationship. But the point is like, I just like nothing could stop me. And I wasn't, I wasn't bragging. It wasn't like flexing like I bet you guys didn't have a big, no, no, no. Here's, let me tell you exactly why. And this is probably true for many of us. Because I was single for a long time before that. And single to the long enough where I actually started to think, like, am I ever going to find someone? Like, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some people already started nodding, like, yeah, that was me. Like, I get that, right? Like, I started to actually, like, wonder, like, and, and, and you just suffer, like, from just that feeling of just, like, dead inside and alone. And, like, I, and I just want to find, like, that person. And then you do, and you want to shout it, or in my case, post it from the rooftops. That's what you want to do. Love can't help itself but to be announced. And we, we do completely ridiculous things when we're in love. Amen? Amen? I remember when I was trying to woo my wife, and I came up with this incredible idea. Now, I didn't, I didn't just, like, go, like, ask her out, and I... We, I wanted to, we wanted to do a group thing. I'm like, I need to get to know her first. Even though, y'all, I was like head over heels. This black cat was smitten as could be. <laughs> and so <laughs> I came up with a plan with my best friend at the time um, that how I was going to like sweep her off her feet. Um, here's just some friendly advice. When you're trying to figure out how to girl, to, to get a, you know, sweep a girl off her feet, like don't go to a homeschooler for, to come up with a plan. Cause like, I, that's what I did and it totally backfired. And so. My plan was I was going to, I was, we were going to go out to eat and uh, with this big group. And uh, we were a bunch of the leaders uh, in my youth ministry at church, we were going to ask them, but we were going to ask all those leaders at the last possible minute so, like, nobody could come. And then it would just be, like, me and her and a couple other people that I actually wanted there. And it would be good. And because there's not this big group, I'll actually get to know, be like an accidental double date. You know what I'm saying. You're just like, some of y'all, like, that makes a lot of sense. Like, it's foolproof. <laughs> Except I invited all those leaders at the last minute, and they all said they were able to come. So this was a massive problem because my plan, that was only part of my plan. The other plan was because it was a smaller group of people, I was going to pay for everybody so that I could pay for her without it being weird. Yes. And some of y'all are like, you're insane. I know. Um, and so I'm like, this will this'll work out perfectly until everyone could come. Now the only way I could pay for everyone is if I emptied my bank account. Why? Because we didn't just plan on like going to the movies. We planned on going out for Chinese food and then going to the arcade and going bowling and going and doing all these things. And I wanted to pay for everyone. And so I did. And for me, 
I kept running to the ATM. I'm like, I need to go to the bathroom. And I'd go to the ATM to check my balance and it became like a slot machine, right? Like I'm putting my card in, I'm like, big money, big money. And then eventually I was like negative balance and it kept going negative, negative, negative. And I was freaking out. Um, but if I had to go all the way back and do it all over, I would do it again and again and again probably with overdraft protection. <laughs> because true love does completely ridiculous and radical things. True love is to be announced. It doesn't care about the, the consequences. I'm going to tell everyone everywhere, this is the mode that these shepherds got in upon seeing the person of Jesus. God in that moment gave them two things. One, a story to tell and a song to sing. A story to tell and a song to sing. And from that moment, they went town to town to town, telling everybody, proclaiming of the good news of Jesus, proclaiming of this hope, and singing and worshiping. Now, I'm guessing they didn't have a musical background. It was probably off key, probably sharp, probably flat. That's not the point. That's not the point of the story. The point was God had given them something. God give, allowed them to be part of a greater story, a story bigger than themselves. And it's something they couldn't keep to themselves. They couldn't help but contain, or they couldn't contain it. They wanted to tell the entire world because that's what true love does. I wonder today, do you have a story to tell and a song to sing? Do you have a story to tell and a song to sing? Some of you, you just don't think that you have a story because of how messy it is. Can I tell you, the greatest glory God receives are in some of the messiest stories. And for some of us, that's the part we want to leave out. And that's where God's glory is. It's not with just who we are today. It's who we used to be. It's the mistakes we used to make. It's all the failures we used to make over and over. It's how toxic our relationships used to be. And God receives the glory when we say, look how far we've come. Look how far we've brought. This is where I was. This is where I am. Only but by the grace of God. And this, friends, is the good news of the gospel. God is writing a story on the fabric of your life. And it isn't just for you. It is so that like these shepherds, you can proclaim the goodness and testify of the goodness and the grace of God displayed in your life. He wants to put a new song in your heart and on your lips that I believe will transform your world from the inside out. The problem is so many of us have become like professional Christians, you know what I mean? Like we know what to say, we know when to say it. We know how to act, how to carry ourselves. Even if we go through something, we know how to like carry ourselves in such a way where people are like, wow, they're really strong. They're like really, really good Christian. Yet the word of God says that Jesus came, baby Jesus in a manger. He came to seek and to save, not the person that has it all figured out, not the person that puts on the false strength, that he came to seek and to save that which was lost, that which was hurting. He who is broken, the person that is, seems they're, like they're furthest from God, out of God's reach can't explain some pain that they have, can't, don't understand why they've been depressed as long as they have. That's the person that Jesus came for. So this idea that we need to try to clean ourselves up, can I tell you, the gospel going on a search isn't us climbing up the ladder to get to God. What we celebrate in the Christmas story is God climbing all the way down the ladder to a manger, then walking from a manger to a cross to get to you. This is the good news of the gospel this Christmas. You have a story to tell, friends. You have a story that God is writing. For some of you, God is writing that this morning. And he wants to put a song in your heart. And today, I just want to give you the opportunity to respond to that word. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to what the Holy Spirit is currently doing in your heart as I'm talking right now. And so I'm just going to ask we just bow our heads in this place as we wrap things up. We're going to take a moment in just a second, and we're going to respond and worship. And we're going to light candles, and we're going to celebrate Jesus as we essentially sing happy birthday to him. But I, 
but I would be remiss if I didn't just take a moment for us to respond to the gospel. And so as all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed, maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, that's me, Pastor John. I've been searching, but I haven't found him. And I haven't been searching with my whole heart. Word of God says, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. So maybe you've been around things that are of Jesus, but you haven't surrendered your life to him. You can have a fresh start today. You can have a fresh start with him today. Your life can be radically changed and transformed. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things go away, new things have come. And there's a new work that Jesus wants to do in your life and through your life, and you can have a fresh start with him today. No more searching. It's time that you find, receive, so that you can begin to proclaim the story and the song that God wants to put within you. And so if that's you today, you would say, I'm done searching. I want to receive Jesus. Wherever, wherever you're at in the room, on the count of three, I'm going to just ask that you just lift your hand in the air. Now, now, you might ask, well, why do we do that? Well, because Jesus says in his word, when you recognize me here on earth, I will recognize you before my Father in heaven. I also believe it'll make it all the more real for you. You'll always remember the time that, that you raised your hand, you res responded outwardly to what the Holy Spirit was doing inwardly and was whispering to you inwardly. And so if that is you today, you would say, I do, I want to walk with Jesus. Just respond to the gospel. One, two, three. All over this room, just lift your hand. Awesome. Anyone else? Awesome. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? It's not too late. Awesome. Anyone else? I see it. I see it. God sees it. God sees it. Awesome. Awesome. You can put your hands down. Well, church family, we're going to all pray this prayer out loud to support all those that are praying this prayer for the very first time. So you can just repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.